It's a blessing to be here with you this morning. For those of you that didn't get that, that's okay. I bring greetings from Southeastern California Conference, and it is a blessing to come and serve our pastors in any way that we can. I serve with John, Elder John Ciccarelli, and it's a blessing to work with him and his heart and his experience. I get to be one of the, the, the younger one and uh, like his youth pastor that's helping him, and it's been a blessing so far. You have two great ones here. I'm blessed by Pastor Joe, and I'm so glad that we got a chance to steal him from Florida Conference and bring him over here to Southeastern. And I learned, you know, one of his several skills. I, I, you know, I knew he was a sharp dresser. I always, you know, see the, the nice jackets and stuff that he wears. But I now found that he can play the cajon as well. And I love that. It brought back memories for me too of when I was helping out in that way with my youth group um, at times when I needed to fill in. Wanted to also just grateful for Pastor Tanya and her ministry here at this church, all that she does for the youth and young adults here. Both Pastor Tanya and I spent a little bit of time together at La Sierra and I'm just thankful for her invitation to come and speak here today. So I also have family, and Tanya mentioned that my wife is here, my daughter's here, she's four, my son is two months old. So we are in the sleep depth phase where we are trying to figure out how to survive on less sleep. But God is good, amen? As we sang today, the goodness of God, yes, sustains us and gets us through even as young parents. <clears throat> I also have some other family here. Um, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, I believe, are either here or almost, and then I have my uncle and my aunt that live nearby that also came today to support me and, and be here at Laguna Niguel. My, my, my opening question to you all today is, what do you love most about Christmas? For kids, right, it's, it's the magic of Christmas, right? It's the imagining of Santa Claus and reindeer, and I won't burst any bubbles today. But maybe for you, it's, it's the changing of weather. And no, we don't get snow here, right? You have to go up into the hills and the mountains to get that up to Big Bear. But you know, it gets a little bit cooler, and we get to wear some outwear that we don't typically wear. We, we wear jackets like people you know, on the East Coast don't bring out for weather like this. We were like, we, we, there's an excuse for us to wear our outwear, right? Some of us like the, the, the hot drinks that we get during this time, the hot cocoa or, or apple cider or, or, or something else that you might drink that helps to warm your soul during this Christmas season. Or maybe it's the music. For you, I'm gonna ask you this, when does Christmas music start playing? Is it November 1? <laughs> or is it Team Never, I hate Christmas, I don't, I don't. but you might hate Christmas music. I, I do appreciate Christmas music, but I tell you it does not come on on November 1. I wait for December because I believe that Thanksgiving is more than a day. It should be a season of gratitude. But I'm not going to hate on anybody that wants to, walk, to, to have their Christmas music early. The number one Christmas song uh, in America, there was, there was these memes that were coming up in the fall of this year of Mariah Carey's CD thawing because the Christmas playlists were about to begin there was this particular firm that did research on what the number one Christmas songs are across the nation. And can you imagine who came number one? Mariah Carey did. We're all I want for Christmas is you. That's probably not your favorite song. Maybe yours is Jingle Bells or Feliz Navidad or Maybe you love listening to uh, Frank Sinatra, more classic, or someone that's more modern like a Michael Buble. And then there are the Christmas carols that we sing at church and in our cars and at homes as well, the silent nights and the joy to the world. There's something that brings out the festive experience of this holiday season. For others of you, it might be the Christmas tree or the lights that light up. I'm glad I got to be here on the, the Sabbath of the, 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 the angel going up on the tree. That's awesome. Um, 
for us, it's our tradition to always get a live Christmas tree, a live cut Christmas tree and put it in our home. And my daughter, she's been decorating now, or at least trying to, you know, I won't tell you how much we have to redo it afterwards and when she goes to bed. But, but when she's done, she gets so excited and she looks up at me and Connie and she says, it's perfect. And the smell of that tree just fills our home and it just feels like Christmas. Maybe for others of you, it's the gifts and, and the anticipation of what you're going to get next Sunday. <gasps> what are the presents that you're going to open and maybe for some of you, you celebrated it a little bit early on Christmas Eve, and then others of you celebrate it on Christmas morning. Our house is divided because my wife is Latina, so for her culture, they do it Christmas Eve. And so we've kind of had this thing where we do it with her family Christmas Eve, and we do it with our family on Christmas morning. Uh, whatever makes it work for you, right? And gifts, yes, they make Christmas fun and they build anticipation, but I would argue that the thing that connects us all the most to Christmas are the people that we spend it with. And maybe Mariah Carey has something when she says, all I want for Christmas is you. I know that sounds a little cringe and, and, and a little sappy, but I believe that this is rooted in the Advent story more than any other tradition of being with someone. God came to be with us. Today's message is entitled, With You. Will you bow your heads with me real quick? Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue to look at your word today, I pray that you would move in mighty ways and that Jesus will be lifted up, and that we would see you, and that we would be drawn closer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles if you do have them. We'll be reading from the NIV translation, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Say amen when you get there, or we have it on the screen. All right. The Bible says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. The Lord is is with you. Pause there. In this short pericope, there is so much to unpack, and we won't just stay here, but, but we're going to start here. Luke has just finished telling a strange story about Zach and Liz. You know, Zachariah and Elizabeth, right? Zachariah and Elizabeth were this old couple that were too old to have any kids that were beyond the age of, of giving birth, and yet the Bible says that Elizabeth is in the sixth month of her pregnancy. Strange things are happening. And now we have another angel visiting. Again, an angel shows up now in the village of Nazareth to the home of a teenage girl who is engaged to be married. I know that sounds weird. In our culture, there's, there's no I, you know, c conception for that. There's no idea for that. Like, but, but in, 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 in Jesus' day, there, there was no idea of going to college and, and, and starting a career and waiting till you're 25, 35, 40 before you get married. There was, there was, this, there was this very real sense that girls, be, after they became a certain age and they were able to have their, their monthly cycles after a certain amount of time, they typically were betrothed. They were put into a marriage relationship. And and most likely, we don't know for sure how old Mary was, but most likely she was a teenager. She was a young woman. And the angel shows up in her home. I don't know what that's like. I don't know if she's cooking, you know, some nice uh, vegan sausage. And she was enjoying, you know, uh, 
a, a, little, a little breakfast there, and all of a sudden, as she's sitting there, the, the angel just appears, and she's like, whoa, what's going on, right? The, 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 the angel is the first one to speak, and the angel tells her that she is highly favored, and he greets her that the Lord is with her. She's kind of puzzled, like, <laughs> okay, what's going on? She's, she's worried. She's afraid. And I can just imagine the expressions on her face. I will not try to reenact them. But, but she's probably showing on her face that she's puzzled, that she's concerned, that she's wondering what's going on, and she's trying to figure it out. And the angel is like, wait, Mary, I know you're in your head right now. I know you're trying to figure out what's going on. I know you don't understand it. I know you're, you're, you're in awe, and I know you're slightly afraid. And so the angel, the first thing he says to her is, do not be afraid. And that's what angels always do when they show up. I don't know, you know, how bright they are or how, how, how glorious they are, but, but, but when angels showed up, at least in the Bible times, they didn't come in human form in, in the same kind of way where they kind of just slipped in incognito, that they always came with this sense of when they were going to deliver a message with the power and authority of God, and, and it was as if people would fall down afraid and like, man, if you're an angel, I can only imagine how much God is different than me, how much more powerful God is than me. And Mary is also slightly troubled and afraid. But the angel says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Mary. Why is it that sometimes we get uncomfortable when we recognize the presence of God? Why is it that sometimes we, we kind of pull back? Like we love the idea of praising and worshiping God and thinking of God from a distance of being in church and it's safe. And, but, but if you've ever been in a situation where you felt the presence of God and you knew that what was happening around you was beyond human explanation, why is it that we get a little bit nervous? Is it because... We don't have control? Is it because we don't know what's going to happen next? Is it because even though we know that God is good and that God loves us and that God is for us, we still wonder how God views us? I'm not perfect. I wasn't perfect this week. I didn't make every right decision. God, you see me as I am. Do you still love me? I know you do, but I, I'm just a little bit nervous. I, I know people love the projection of me, but do people really love me for me? I know people, people admire me from a distance, but do people know that really truly know me? Do they still see me the same? God, do you still see me the same when you come close? Mary is wrestling with it just like we do because, see, there's something about having someone with you on a horrible or terrible day, that is a great person to be with, right? Because if you're having a horrible day and someone comes with you and, 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 they, and they listen to you and they cheer you up and they say, man, let's get out, let's go play some basketball or let's go shop, let's go do something, and they break you out of the funk that you're in and, and the feelings that you're being overwhelmed with and they get you out of your head and they, they get you into a space where you feel alive again and you feel okay, like that's a person you want in your, in your life, in your corner, right? But if you have a person that's like negative Nancy, and if there's a Nancy here, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> but, but they just always, like, you're, you're sharing your feelings, and they just, like, keep coming back as if it's a competition. You're like, no, I'm not trying to have a competition. I'm trying to tell you what I'm going through, and they're just comparing themselves with you. They're just trying to downplay everything that you're saying as if it's not important or it's nothing. Those are the kinds of people that you don't want in your corner. And there's this question of, God, I know you're for me, but uh, man, God, when you really get close, are we going to be okay? And the first point I want to make is this, that God being with you, being with us is good news. You and I, as the angel tells us, have nothing to fear. God does not have a look of a disappointing parent. 
God does not have a look of someone who's trying to figure out what you're doing to judge you and critique you and put you in your place. God is saying, I know you, and I still call you like Mary, highly favored. Because your favor isn't based on what you do. Yes, Mary has this unique mission where she is going to take the Son of God in her womb and she's going to give birth. There's no other woman that was able to do that on the face of the earth. She has this special place. Of course, she's highly favored. But the reason why she's favored is because God is with her. And the question I have, is God with you? And if God is with you, you are highly favored favored because God's favor is upon those who are in proximity with him who is God close to any one who will recognize it anyone who will trust it It's important to have people in your corner and in your life that you can trust and that you know is a safe space. All over the news this week, people were talking about DJ Twitch and the tragedy that, of him taking his life this week. Just how could this happen? How could someone that seems like they have everything together and they're okay end up here? And it brought questions, discomfort. Coming back to God, God is a safe space. Someone that we can go to without fear. Someone that's in our corner. And you might look at Mary and say, man, Mary was the good kid. Mary had it all together. She was the one that was, a, was she was a virgin. She, she, she did the stuff she was supposed to do. And that's not me. I've made mistakes. I, I'm not everything that Mary is or was. And and. Does God truly see me as highly favored? God shows up in our life, and God's favor rests on all of us because you are his child. I didn't understand this until I became a parent, how much I love my child. How much I will do for my child. I will spend all night up after working all day if I have to for my child. I'll change dirty diapers that I won't change for anybody else for my child. I'll go without eating so that they can eat for my child. I'll make sure that I rearrange my schedule so that they can do something that they love for my child. And if I can do that as a human, how much more can God do that for you and for me. The second point that I want to make today is choosing joy. Christmas is the season of joy, and we, we love to, to, to feel its festive spirit and to come into it and, and, and its warmth, and there's just, people just feel better. They're nicer, right, during this time of year. You know, less likely to get flipped off, less likely to get honked at, less likely to have, you know, people run over you uh, in in shopping unless it's Black Friday. (laughs) But most of us have learned by now that we do our shopping online, amen? So, you know, it's the comfort of your couch at home. But when Mary receives this invitation, she sees it not as something to be afraid of, but she sees it as something that she accepts gladly. I mean, she grew up hearing the stories all the time of of how the Messiah would come and how the Messiah would be born of a virgin in Isaiah. She knew the stories and and probably the various folk tales that came out of it, she knew them, but but now she's the one that's being invited into the story to be the one, to be the mother of the Son of God. And while she has her questions, like how is this gonna happen? Gabriel, I, you know, there's nothing that's been happening, and so I don't know how I'm going to have a child. And Gabriel says, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will in some way make sure that you are able to have Jesus. We don't know the details. She didn't know the details. But she says yes, not understanding, even in mystery, even not understanding everything that's going on, Mary's response reverberates still into our world today. 
I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. The story shifts and we end up in a Judean town up in the hills where Elizabeth is six months pregnant. And I want to encourage you, if you've never read this story, if you haven't read it in a while, read it. There's not a lot of stories of, of beautiful stories of, of women as heroines in the Bible. And, and here you have Elizabeth and Mary and their stories of how they come alive. And it almost moves into this Disney musical when all of a sudden it moves into this music and this song and Mary begins to sing. And just like a musical where, where what the song conveys is, is even more powerful than what the narrative could share in the same amount of time. Here these two women, one much older, her older cousin, and one much younger, young teenage Mary coming together seeing the miracle of what God has done in their lives, telling their testimonies, telling their stories to each other and celebrating. Elizabeth says that John jumps in her womb. I don't know if she was counting kicks when that happened, but, but here John does. He leaps in her womb and she feels it and she says there's something special about your child. He's the one. He's the Messiah. And Mary begins to sing a song of how God takes those on the margins, on the edges of society, and on the edges of the main story and turns them into the protagonist and the hero. Joy is everywhere, and Mary is so joyful, but she doesn't know, she doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know that Jesus isn't going to be the king that sits on David's throne in her lifetime. She doesn't know that Jesus is going to be the suffering servant of Isaiah. She doesn't know that when she has to go from Bethlehem to Nazareth, they're not going to even be having a place to stay. She doesn't know all the challenges and all the situations she's going to go through. And so in these moments, she says yes to these expectations that she's forming of what God will look like to her in this experience. And when God doesn't look like that, does she continue to choose joy? See, joy is not only something that we experience externally that hits us and we begin to feel it inside. It is something that you and I can also choose to do, to be joyful versus to be down. Our want for joy can be greater than the pain that we might be experiencing. One particular author calls joy a discipline, a spiritual discipline. We think of spiritual disciplines, we think of prayer and, and, and reading our Bibles, and we think of fasting, but we don't think of choosing joy. But practicing joy is practicing the presence of God, because where God is, there is joy. When we recognize that even when we're going through challenging circumstances, and even though God feels absent, God says that he will never leave us nor forsake us, and that means that even in the challenge, God is where? Right beside me. I don't feel God, I don't sense God, I don't see God, but God is there. And so I choose joy because I choose that what God is choosing to do in the circumstance is going to work out for my good, even when it feels like it's working out for my bad. The joy of Christmas wears out soon after New Year's as we've tried to do our New Year's resolutions and they fail and we're just like back to square one again. How do we allow the joy of Advent to continue on beyond the season where everyone feels great to the seasons of our life when things go up and down? Even now, it can be for some of you a trying time. It can be a blue Christmas because it reminds you of the people that are no longer here. But I want you to know that God is still here with you if you are feeling that right now. We tend to fill our lives with everything so that there is no moments where there is silence. Social media, Netflix, podcasts, all the alerts on our phones, a book, a playlist. There's always something going on, a TV in the background, always noise to help us feel that we're not alone and that we're safe. 
to take away spaces of boredom and loneliness. And yet in this connected reality, so many people experience more isolation through technology. God longs for us to step back and to take margins in our lives and to pause and to slow down and to recognize that we don't have to numb ourselves, but he's right here and he's there for us and he's working things out for our good. We can sit there and we can choose joy, not a manufactured joy built on nostalgia, but on a joy that is built by the gift that God has given us in Jesus The last point that I'd like to make is that God is calling you and I to have an expanding heart. In this story, God's heart expands further and further and further. He expands it in Liz and Zach's life as this older couple is able to have a baby and the impossible becomes true. They are on the margins of their society and Elizabeth says that when God gave her a baby that the whispers that were going on around her are now no longer being spoken. Mary is on the margin. She is not someone who would likely be picked. She might have been seen as righteous and, and, and a good girl, but she was not the girl that would have been picked for the play. She wasn't the one that everyone was noticing, and she sees herself as being on the margins of the story and being ushered in. Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. She sees her story as a story of reversal, and then she begins to sing you and I into the story as she speaks of God turning our situations and our stories around. We meet the shepherds who are no longer a high important job in Israel. Some commentators have argued that shepherds weren't even allowed to testify in court, and yet here they are testifying to the coming of Jesus. The wise men are outsiders too, men from a faraway country. Even the genealogy tells stories of women on the margins, Ruth, Rahab, Bathsheba, Tamar. God's ever-opening heart to the world is one that sweeps all of us into the Advent story, not just those that walk into the, into the doors of this church, not just those that show up into a church down the street, but every single person, including the person that you and I might walk across the street not to come across. I remember when my wife was pregnant with our second child. And I wondered how I could love my second child as much as I loved my daughter. Because I'm a girl dad. When I come home from work, my little girl runs out to the garage. And she runs out and she begins to say, Papa, Papa, Papa. I pop open the door. She jumps up into my lap. She gives me a hug. And I don't care what has happened to me that day. At that moment, life is good. I'm choosing joy. And, 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 and I'm like, she's, I mean, I'm putty in her hands at times. She knows it. She knows how to pull those cards. She knows how to do it, too. And I'm like, God, I have so much love for my daughter. How am I going to love my son? How is my heart going to open to him? And I remember Connie grieving because we have our daughter for like four years. And she's like, we're not going to have the same relationship with Ari now that we're going to have another child. How is this going to work? And we talked through that as young parents. You, you all might remember those days. And, 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 and we get to the point where Liam is born. And we're holding Liam in our, in our arms. And at that moment, I didn't have to wonder how my heart was going to open up. Because it was already open. As I held this little guy in my arms. This little guy who looked like me. It's easy to love people that look like you, right? It's easy to love people that remind us of ourselves, that have the same goals and dreams and aspirations, the same bank accounts, the same politics, the same vacation plans. We love those kinds of people. 
But what about the people that don't look like us, that don't wear what we wear, that don't go to the places that we go, that live a different lifestyle, that have a different orientation, that have a different value system, that don't have your faith, that might even be atheistic. How do we allow the Christmas story, the Advent story, to move beyond something that's an idea that sounds nice on a Hallmark card to a reality of touching people's lives beyond our circle, touching people's lives that need to know that Jesus is real, that God sees them as highly favored and that God is for them and that all they have to do is to recognize that God is already there. I want to encourage you all as we come to a close. When you think of God with you, I want you to think of a person that loves you, that would literally give up a part of themselves. God the Father gives up God the Son. He gifts his son to humanity to become human. God is willing to give up the thing that he loves the most to save people that he loves just as much. If you ever doubt God's love for you, look at Jesus. Look at Bethlehem. Look at the story and know God is willing to go as far as it takes to save you and I. And because that is a reality, on the days that we wake up and we don't feel that, I want to encourage you to continue to choose joy. And because you're so joyful and you're not a down Christian and you're not, you know, the negative Christian that everyone is seeing around them and you're like, like, what's different about you? What have you got? You've got some good juice, like you've got a cup of grace, like what is going on? What do you have that, that, that's different? Because I know a lot of Christians, but they're not like you. And this joy so exudes you and I that the people that God brings into our circle that we wouldn't normally open our heart to because they don't look like us become a part of our story and become a part of the story of God. Let God be with you. Choose joy and recognize his presence and open your heart to the ones he brings your way.